Okay, this lesson for our Cornet Project class asks the question, is there hope for a church during the Great Tribulation? And no, this lesson is not to determine pre, mid, or post, but rather to discuss the reality of a church during the Great Tribulation and would there be any hope? Thus, I place it under a category called ecclesiastical eschatology. Uh, this is just a brief snippet for pre-tribulation. This view maintains that the rapture occurs when Jesus comes. It will be secretly to gather the saved, all the saved, and then, of course, uh, that word church is used synonymously by multitudes in an institutional sense, and also some actually teach that all the saved are the church, and that's before the seven-year Great Tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. So that's pre-trib and a thumbnail. Then flipping the script, I found this recently, Berean Bible Society. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. And they made the comment, uh, but from Matthew 24 itself, it is still more evident that the passage cannot refer to the rapture. Now again, from, says, uh, from my viewpoint, uh, in my early years as a child, we just heard rapture. We didn't hear anything in relation to tribulation somewhere out in the future. Certainly not that we would be here within days of the seven-year tribulation period, nor did I even know what that was. I'd heard of it, but we had never done any of the calculations, nor we had we been taught to notice certain things that must take place before Christ returns, because the rapture was instantaneous, secret, unannounced, and we would just disappear. So true, they say here, the passage says the one shall be taken, the other left. But where and how will the one be taken and what will be the lot of the one who is left behind? From the verses immediately preceding, it is evident that the coming of Christ to earth to judge and reign is in view. This coming is likened to what happened in the days of Noah. The people ate and drank, married and gave away again in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. These people were not taken away to glory, they were taken away in judgment. So since verse 40 and 41, as this article says, are a continuation of this illustration, it's evident that the two taken away are taken away in judgment at our Lord's return to reign, while the two who are left are left to enter into his millennial reign. This interpretation alone is consistent with the whole context. So uh, the first time I'd heard something like this, it was a lifetime ago, early years of the seminary, where there was uh, observations of parallelism and context. And uh, so that was quite uh, fascinating to me because it didn't help me appreciate pre-trib. It just helped me understand that now I would have to know when the return was being discussed as opposed to when the rapture was being discussed before I had heard all of the rapture preached from any of the texts that would otherwise have spoken of the return. So let's move on again. We're asking, is there any hope for a church who is here during the Great Tribulation. Uh, the Mid-Tribulation view asserts that the rapture occurs after the first three and a half years, that is of a seven-year period when the Antichrist acquires global power. So uh, at least this one says we're here. So we uh, move on into the middle of this seven-year period because the first half until after he breaks his covenant and then demands worship, he deifies himself, enthrones himself in God's temple declares himself to be God, then the uh, persecution and the severity of it, as Revelation speaks of, uh, will not have taken place. So basically, pre-trib, mid-trib, both are um, avoid the most hellacious time on earth. There's a pre-wrath rapture. Now, if you'd have told me these things 40 years ago, I would have I had never heard of any of it, but it says states that the rapture will occur at the end of the tribulation prior to the outpouring of God's wrath. Well, of course, I don't know anyone who believes God's wrath is targeted to God's people since the Bible says that those who are negating persuasion by the Son, they will not see life, but the wrath from the God is already abiding upon them. That's in John 3.36. The wrath of God is not abiding upon a believer. So why the rapture would be shown to be a means of avoiding that, uh, I'm not sure, because it's not possible that God's wrath would be targeted to us as believers under any circumstance. Even logistically, it's not possible. Uh, Post-tribulation, this view sees the rapture as occurring simultaneous 
to the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation. Now, this is where uh, our research and one of the biggest challenges or largest challenge for me was this next text, uh, which I'll show you after this. I drew this diagram showing the return, the resurrection, rapture, and it is simultaneous. And that's true according to the uh, Koine Greek text. First Thessalonians 4.17, I'll just read the highlighted part. There you can see the Greek there. Uh, again, it feels like I'm cheating since I'm not freehanding this, but it's okay. Then we ourselves, the ones who are living, the ones remaining around, simultaneously together with them, will be seized away. So notice that simultaneously is an adverb. So uh, we will be seized away simultaneously together with them. Now, that's referring to uh, previously stated the uh, dead in Christ would be raised first. Then we ourselves, the ones who are living, the ones remaining around, will be seized simultaneously together with them. So the notion of simultaneity is specifically stated. And in the Vulgate, where there's a challenge about the word rapture itself, you can notice rapture in the Latin, but you can also notice simul, the first four, well, you know, one, two, first five letters in simultaneous are also in the Vulgate, which was very fascinating for those of us in this language class. Uh, but Revelation 3.10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, this was a text that's usually um, refuted because it suggests that people who believe in pre-trib really depend upon this text. Of course, we have another lesson where I included people in the pre-trib, whatever camp or supporters of pre-tribulation, don't agree that this refers to the Great Tribulation. But notice the condition here is kept the word of my patience. Now, the first act to keep the word of his patience is to believe him for everlasting life. It's to not negate the persuasion by the resurrection of Jesus Christ because the Bible says God the Father holds that persuasion alongside all men when he raised Jesus from the dead. And the Bible says that it was Jesus who died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that was for our justification. So keep the word of his patience uh, initially and essentially includes, first and foremost, believe him for everlasting life. Now, the idea that this is written to an ecclesia, a church in Philadelphia, they've come together and covenant together as a covenant community. and in that deliberate effort and uh, preference on their part and not negated the persuasion, the call of discipleship. There's the persuasion to believe the gospel and to believe Jesus for everlasting life, which is the same thing. Then there is the call to come, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him. That's discipleship. Uh, that's costly. We're told by Jesus to count the cost. He tells that to people who believe. Uh, everlasting life is free gift of God, but to be a disciple can even and has throughout history cost people their lives literally because of persecution. So he says he would keep them out from the hour of temptation. So if this is reference to the uh, seven year tribulation period, then this kept here from the hour, actually that is uh, referring to the duration of that that word keep there is it here. Let's go look at it. I'll just read the highlighted part because that gives us the causal basis. You kept the word of the patience of me. Now the patience of Jesus, that word patience, those of you that are in the Koine class, you see that's made of two words, hippomone, the remaining under. And it says he remained obedient until death, until the death of the cross. The word obedient was there and that text used for remaining under the voice. He remained under the load, his patience to fulfill the law, fulfill all righteousness, and do that, and then become a curse and be hanged on a tree uh, is what this is referring to. This is all that Jesus did, his redemptive work, his finished work. It's the work he accomplished on the cross. I also will keep you out from the hour of the trial. Now, this idea here is just like the rich young ruler who said, I kept these laws from my youth. It's referring to the duration of this keep. But now keep here uh, is the same word at, at the first sentence, because you kept, I will keep. That word means adhere to and to guard something. 
So Jesus says, I will adhere to you. I will guard you from the time of that hour of the trial, uh, of the trial being about to come upon the entire inhabited earth to try out the ones dwelling accordingly. That is upon the earth. So notice this. They're being tried out. We're being kept out. There's quite a contrast there. So there is hope for the ecclesia in the tribulation. Uh, I've heard all the positives about pre-trib, a positive about mid-trib, positive about pre-wrath, showing that the wrath from God is not intended for us. But we have no Bible text anywhere that even calls us to suppose, think, or even uh, notice an inference, infer from any text that the wrath of God would have anything to do with us as believers, much more these who are now following him as disciples, as an ecclesia called out, severed their ties and covenant together. And these people uh, at this time in the first century experienced great persecution, which was triggered by baptism. Now, it wasn't, the Bible doesn't teach baptismal regeneration. Uh, this, according to Luke 730, it says by being baptized, people declare God right. He doesn't declare us right by being baptized. That happens when we believe in Jesus Christ, Galatians 2.16 we believed into Jesus Christ or that we might be justified out from the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So yes, there's hope here. Uh, we have a text that can show us that it's not about where will we be, it's where he will be. He will be with us, keeping us, guarding us, adhering to us for the duration of this trying out uh, that the world will be uh, experiencing. Now, like the world today, like the world in the first century, it's not what God's doing to us that's our concern. It's what on one hand, there was maniacal uh, religious, re maniacal religionists and tyrannical tyrants. Uh, there were kings who were tyrants. The Caesars deified themselves. If you didn't worship them, you could be put to death. And you could also be uh, placed outside the economy, just as they feared in the days Christ was here to be put out of the synagogue. And they would forfeit the economy just as if they were placed outside of Judaism in the first century those that said they were Jews, but they were not. They were simply a synagogue of opposition and adversity against Christ's ecclesia, Christ and his churches there in the book of Revelation. And then on the other hand, they had uh, the Caesar and the Roman government that if you didn't comply with their stipulations, their state imposed dogma, you were persecuted. So state religion on one hand, uh, well, state established paganism on one hand, polytheism, the government, the Caesar, and then the Judaizers on the other hand. So it was a very precarious position for them. And they had earned this promise that when the trying out of the inhabited world would occur, and it did occur in their lifetime, then this promise, however, is timeless. These are aorist tense because you kept the word, you keep the word. So any ecclesia that has done this and does this uh, has every reason for this hope and this encouragement. So. Second Thessalonians, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, and I put of what chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Here we have the text. I'll read the highlighted portion. We ourselves, but we ourselves are owing to be correctly gracing to the God always concerning you all, brethren, beloved ones by Lord, because the God preferred you all for himself. That's a word preferred. It's not the word elect as often assumed because of the English translation. Away from beginning unto salvation in sanctification of spirit and faith of truth. So away from beginning of what? Well, I supplied it from the context twice. Tribulation is mentioned. So away from beginning. Now you notice that. Uh, so away from, and you can go from left to right and notice that even that is saying away from beginning so from the beginning of the tribulation of tribulation even on the great scale the tribulation the great one uh, here's what god preferred for them salvation unto what were they preferred by god unto salvation salvation here refers to deliverance preservation and safety so yes uh, when we notice all the positives of pre-trib mid-trib and then pre-wrath uh, I just want to make sure that the emphasis here is on the positive and the hope that can be found uh, for an ecclesia uh, that is in the Great Tribulation, that Christ would not abandon us, would not forsake us, not leave us orphans. He would be with us in association with us 
until the end of the age. So have a blessed day. Enjoy this lesson and just consider the implication of this good news.